So I'm a professor of statistics at Tel Aviv University. Uh, I have some uh, uh, some history of doing work in statistical genetics, but but this talk is really going to be about hardcore statistical methods. Uh, I think everyone will see the applicability, and and I'll, I'll try to. I've tried to build it as some mix of, uh, of uh, tutorial and, and research talk, knowing that, uh, uh, expecting that many of the audience don't know the, the specific details of, of how things uh, work in, in, uh, in, in statistical hypothesis testing. So uh, let's start uh, slowly. Uh, so uh, when we talk about hypothesis testing, uh, then uh, we think of the null hypothesis as representing some common wisdom, uh, uh, current knowledge, and the alternative hypothesis for us, is, at least in the scientific context, the alternative hypothesis is, there is the, that there is some scientific discovery to be made here, right? And when we think about it that way, so we think of controlling the level of the test, controlling type one error, it's just a way to keep the scientist honest about the fact that the discoveries being made are really discoveries and not just some uh, coincidences. But really, as scientists, what we care about or what we should care about is the power of the test, right? Or one minus the type two error of the test, because the power of the test is our ability to actually make discoveries. And why do we want to make discoveries? Because if we make discoveries, we publish papers. If we publish papers, we get tenure then we can get full professorship if we keep publishing papers, and if we, are, if we publish really popular papers, we might get a Nobel Prize. And it all starts with having power for our tests, right? And, and this is not completely uh, just, some science, just some statistician's uh, uh, dream, because uh, you know, there was a genius uh, physicist called Higgs, uh, but before someone could get a Nobel Prize for the Higgs boson uh, discovery, they had to build this uh, uh, crazy uh, particle accelerator, and then they had to collect lots of data, and eventually they had to reject the null that uh, uh, there is no Higgs boson and find a significant finding uh, uh, that includes uh, the Higgs boson at specific mass. And once they rejected the null convincingly, then they got a Nobel Prize, or then Higgs got a Nobel Prize. So it's not just uh, uh, statisticians that think that uh, it can lead to Nobel Prizes as well. Uh, and one thing that, that we have to keep in mind, because we're going to see, to see some technical uh, formulations, is that in the real world, alternative hypotheses in science, they are, the alternative hypotheses are complex. So, so for example, the Higgs boson, the alternative was that there is a, 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 this particle at some mass. We don't know what it is. So in that sense, the alternative is complex. But uh, uh, making uh, uh, specific inferences or specific calculations about things like power typically requires a simple null, so a specific alternative that we are interested in. And we will do calculations under the specific simple alternative. So I'm not really introducing from first principles, hoping that everyone has done at least uh, some statistics classes, and you know the mathematical definitions of, this no of these notions like power and uh, level of a test. Okay, so let's, uh, let's bravely write this as in mathematical notation. So uh, we'll define our null hypothesis as having uh, x is some abstract notion of the data we have. It can be anything, any, any relevant uh, uh, notion of data. And the null is that the data has some distribution, and the alternative is a uh, simple alternative is that the data has a different distribution. Uh, and these distributions have uh, densities uh, for our purpose. Uh, let's assume they have densities. We denote the densities by, by small f, the, the distribution, typically the cumulative distribution function by big F. Uh, and so the, the main point of the previous slide was that we care about power. We have to control level of the test to, uh, uh, to be honest, but we care about power. So obviously, uh, we want our tests to have as much power as possible. And everybody, I'm sure, has heard of the Neyman Pearson lemma that is kind of one of the most fundamental results in statistics that says there's, for this problem that we've just defined, there's a well-known uh, way to get the most powerful test. And the way to get the most powerful test is to look at this ratio of the density under the alternative and the density under the null, and reject the null hypothesis, declare uh, uh, 
declare a discovery uh, if that ratio is big, right? It's the likelihood under the alternative distribution divided by the likelihood under the null. And the Neyman Pearson lemma says that such a test with an appropriately selected threshold is the most powerful test possible for this hypothesis. So in that sense, we've completely, for this simple case, we've completely solved the question of what's the best test possible. In a world where we care about power, here's the answer to what's the best test possible. Uh, and a different way to formulate it, which is, uh, I think, useful in general and, and will come handy for us, is instead of thinking about this distribution of the data, do a transformation to p-values. And now we can see an appropriate definition of p-value. Definition of p-value is always a sticky point when you, when you teach uh, uh, undergraduate statistics because it's not very clear what it means to have the cumulative distribution uh, that, that is more extreme than the observed and so on. Once we, have, once we think about likelihood ratios, then the p-value is easily and well-defined because the p-value is the cumulative distribution of the likelihood ratio under the null distribution. The likelihood ratio is some statistic that depends on the data, and so the p-value is the, is the cumulative uh, uh, distribution of the likelihood ratio, and we know that this is true because we know that we are going to be rejecting for large values of the likelihood ratio and uh, not rejecting for small values of the likelihood ratio. So we know this is the right way to transform uh, uh, to transform to a p-value once we have the uh, Neyman-Pearson result. So in that sense, we can reformulate our problem as having a uniform distribution under the null, because under the null, the, the p-value, which is the cumulative distribution of the likelihood ratio, by definition has a uniform distribution, and then it has some other distribution under the alternative. And what we know about this distribution under the alternative, because of the way we've constructed it, we know it has decreasing density under the alternative. So small p-values are more likely than big p-values under the alternative, and this is a direct uh, uh, product of the definition uh, we used in terms of the likelihood ratio. So that's a, that's a, a nice way that's, uh, that's useful for many things to think about all of this after transforming to p-values, which are uh, cumulative distributions of the likelihood ratio. Okay. And in that sense, now the test is going to be reject uh, H0 if this uh, uniform, uh, uh, uniformly distributed random variable is less than the level of the test we want, right? Because we know it has a uniform distribution. We know we're going to be uh, rejecting for small values of the p-value. Uh, and so we, re we, and we also, from that, we can also find out easily that the threshold will be exactly alpha. So this is supposed to be, hopefully, things we all, none of this is supposed to be new, maybe just uh, uh, some refreshing of things we know already. Uh, this is also something we, we probably know, but many uh, of us maybe have never, have never seen it, uh, looked at it this way. Uh, we can think of this most powerful, MP is most powerful, NP is Neyman Pearson, so of this most powerful test problem, we can think of it uh, uh, as an optimization problem, right? Which is saying, uh, let's, uh, let's find, let's call D uh, our, our decision of when we reject the null, and when we don't reject the null, that we're going to be denoted, denoting by D, so a policy of when, for what values of our data we reject the null and for what values of our data we don't reject the null, that's like generically we're going to denote it by D. So the most powerful test problem is the, t the problem of finding the policy which maximizes power, that's the integral uh, uh, in the objective, subject to controlling level, that's the integral in the, uh, in the constraint. Okay, so this is just a different way of writing the exact same thing we said before. Finding a most powerful test at level alpha. This is already formulated in terms of uh, values between 0 and 1. You see on the left that the, uh, the, the function is applied on the range 0 to 1, but we can also do it from the original data. So it would be a function from the, from the range of the data to uh, 0, 1. And this 0, 1 on the right, the discrete 0, 1, is the decision whether to reject or not reject the null. Right? 
And so when we think about it this way, uh, we see what a miracle the Neyman Pearson lemma is. Because this is an integer infinite optimization problem. It's infinite because the, uh, the domain is infinite, is the 0, 1 uh, interval, uh, or the range of x if we do it before transforming two p-values. Uh, and the, the target is the value 0 and 1, so the, the, the values that we have to assign are integer. So this is an integer uh, uh, optimization problem with an infinite number of variables, right? Because we have to determine d at every point in our, uh, in our uh, uh, for every possible data. So uh, in general, it's supposed to be a very difficult uh, problem to solve a problem like that. But the Neyman Pearson lemma tells us that this specific optimization problem uh, actually has a simple solution. We can think of it as, as like an AppSec solution. We look at the ratio. What's the likelihood ratio? It's the how much each point in our, in our space contributes to the uh, objective divided by how much it costs us in the constraint. Right? So it turns out that the problem, uh, uh, that this supposedly very difficult problem has a simple, optimal, provably optimal solution. And that's the Neyman-Pearson lemma specifies. But uh, uh, in my view, the correct way to think about this is in terms of optimization. And once we switch from single testing to multiple testing, it's going to be, uh, maybe we won't really get to it today, but in general for our work, on optimal multiple testing, it's really useful to think about these as optimization problems uh, over uh, appropriate domains. Okay, so uh, let's move from from uh, let's move to a more realistic uh, uh, domain. And when we when we want to be more realistic, those two things we have to uh, think about. One is that we don't have a single uh, test but we have multiple tests being uh, uh, simultaneously done in, uh, in real science, uh, and that our alternatives are generally not simple, but complex. So, uh, so now we have big K uh, tests, uh, and each one of them is testing. We still assume, at least here, that we can transform each one of them using something like likelihood ratio to a p-value. So we have a p-value for each one, which is uniformly distributed under the null. And then we have a family of possible distributions. And the alternative is that uh, one of these uh, uh, distributions is the distribution of our data. So uh, now we have to think about these two aspects of the, of the multiple testing problem. And of course, the first one is, what does it mean to control type 1 error once we move from single testing to multiple testing? And I'm not going to mathematically define these things because I hope uh, we all uh, are familiar with them, but I'll just enumerate uh, uh, sort of the, the most standard options. We might say we want to strongly control family-wise error rate, and strong control means that under any possible combination of which nulls are true and which nulls are false, and what's the parameters for the false nulls, and under any possible combination, we always our method, our D, which tells us when we reject which null, for which, for which observed data we reject which null, uh, is always going to guarantee that the familiarized error rate is controlled at some level alpha, or we might want to have strong control of false discovery rate at, at level alpha, and the notion of strong control is the same, but false discovery rate is a different criterion than familiarized error rate, or we might want to say let's not be so strict and let's not uh, let's not uh, say that anything can happen in the world. But we might assign some distribution over things that might happen in the world and say, in expectation over this, this, this distribution of things that might happen in the world, we want to control some criterion like, like FDR, and I'm going to introduce the two-group model which takes this approach. So we have, to, we have different options, and we have to choose between them what we mean or what we want to control in terms of type 1 error once we are in multiple testing. Uh, and once we've selected, we can uh, start thinking about ways that we can control our selected uh, error measure. For example, we might use Bonferroni for strong familiarized error control, or we might use Benjamini Hochberg for strong FDR control, uh, and there's many other methods. Uh, 
And some of them may require additional assumptions, like Benjamin e. Hochberg requires sort of independence, not exactly independence, but, uh, but it has some limitations when it guarantees uh, what we want. Okay, so we want to take a step back and ask ourselves, now say that we, uh, that we understand that, uh, that we have this multiple testing problem, uh, but we want to think about how should we be designing methods for multiple testing. So uh, we know that there are some, uh, uh, there's different measures of type one error that we have to choose between them. But now we have to remember that we, we argued, at least I argued, that what we really care about as scientists is power. Because power is what gives us tenure, not, uh, not uh, uh, type one error control. Right? So, uh, and if we're less cynical, power is what drives scientific discovery. Uh, so one common argument that you hear a lot is that this is good motivation for selecting type one error control measures that are more liberal, like saying let's control false discovery rate instead of controlling family-wise error rate because that's more liberal, that's going to give us more discoveries and uh, all the good things that come with quote unquote discoveries. Uh, might be a reasonable point of view. I think it's not the right way to think about it. I think the type one error measure is the sanity check that, uh, that is kind of the honesty of the science being done. That's not something that should be selected by, uh, by every scientist for their own research. That's like a community standard of what it means to be honest and not to make uh, false discoveries. So if we agree on that, then it's not supposed to be the, the, the uh, what's, what differentiates uh, different testing methods should not be the type of uh, type one error control, because that's determined by some higher power of the of the community what it means to control type one error. Uh, what scientists or, or what people designing methods should be uh, concerned with is uh, is. The, the, the fact that they want more power, and they want more power not by uh, changing the definition of type one error control, but by designing methods that are going to give them more of the relevant power to make the kind of discoveries that they want to make, or that they think they, the data is likely to hide. So that means that we need to define power. We need to define what power means, or we need each scientist or each one de developing a method need to uh, define the relevant notion of power, and then they can ask for themselves which statistical method or which testing method is going to be most useful in terms of the power that I care about. So one thing they might do is they might take existing methods like, like Bonferroni, uh, 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 Symes, uh, uh, different methods for controlling the same uh, objective or the same type one error and choose between them based on the power they, uh, they want. But they may be more ambitious than that. So we may be more ambitious than that and say, once I know what kind of power I want, can I myself design methods that are good or maybe even optimal in terms of the power that is relevant uh, for my goal? So this is sort of the overarching motivation for our uh, research project that I'm going to describe has, has many different threads. I'm going to describe a couple of them. But the overarching goal is to think about what it means and how can we solve, how can we define properly the problem of most powerful policy in multiple testing, and then how can we actually find policies like that? And then, of course, how much do we gain from doing that? So I'm basically going to give two, two examples or two threads from our research that I'll, I'll give a bit, bit of detail on, and then the others I'll just mention in passing. So the first one is, is a, a seemingly very simple situation uh, that is typical in clinical trials. So we can think of the motivating application as a clinical trial with two endpoints. So for example, the effectiveness of, of a new drug, a clinical trial for effectiveness of a new drug, but we have two subpopulations we're testing in this study. So we're not testing a single hypothesis, but we have two subpopulations in mind uh, uh, in this study. And the community has told us that what you need to do in a clinical trial is to control family-wise error rate, strong control of family-wise error rate, meaning 
No matter what the truth is, your probability of making a false discovery is at most, making any false discovery is at most alpha. So this is something that's given. This is something that's not in our control in this setting. Uh, and what we, the way we think this should be done is uh, uh, now uh, uh, the person designing the study or the scientist or the statistician working with them should come up with a power function. And for example, we might say uh, there's a specific value of effect size. And if it's true that this effect holds for both populations, so the, the, the improvement for both populations is 5%, I want to maximize the probability that I'm going to discover it in at least one of the populations. Right? That's a well-defined goal when I say it. And this is something that I can actually formulate mathematically as an objective for my optimization problem. So given that I have selected, this is just one example. And I'm going to show you what happens under different examples. But this is a, a formulation of what I said in words uh, as an optimization problem. So the objective is that uh, uh, is a mathematical way of writing what I said in words. Uh, and the constraints is what the community uh, uh, dictates, what we call strong familiarizer or control. OK. And what we, uh, what we show uh, in this paper that's about to appear in biometrics is that this is a problem that can actually be solved optimally. And it, uh, it reduces to a Neyman Pearson-like procedure. Uh, and I'm not going to give uh, details because there's no time and because I don't want to uh, bore the audience, but it boils down to, define, to properly defining a score, a score function, and it's supposed to capture how much each decision we make uh, contributes to power and how much it costs in terms of a, a, a type 1 error, and we reject the points with the highest contribution. So this is really a Neyman Pearson-like uh, recipe. And interestingly, once you move beyond two hypotheses to, to three and up, uh, it becomes much less clear what's going on. And in fact, there are some open problems about how you can design recipes like this for three or more hypotheses. So that paper is focused on two hypotheses, actually. Uh, and this is just to show, uh, without getting into detail, the different shapes of rejection regions you get when, uh, when you, what do we get to play with? What we get to play with is what we put in the objective, right? What's, whether it's uh, the probability of rejecting any hypothesis when both are false or rejecting one false hypothesis when the other one, uh, the null holds and so on. And uh, solving this problem with different uh, uh, objective functions gives different shaped optimal rejection regions. So I'm not going to go into details. This is just to show how much gain you get uh, compared to, to what uh, people would be using uh, by default from the literature. And it shows that you gain some. You can argue about uh, what's a substantial uh, uh, increase in power, but you definitely uh, get an increase in power. OK, so uh, the second example is, is a more complicated one. And I see I won't have time to, uh, to give any details. So I'll just talk in general terms for those who know about it. And, and I guess I won't, won't have time to go into detail. So uh, this one has to do with the two-group model, which is a famous model, at least among statisticians, uh, uh, championed by Efron, uh, who's probably the greatest living statistician. Uh, and his idea was uh, that we do a, a large scale testing. So before we were in two hypotheses, if we're going to be doing GWAS or microarray, uh, then we have thousands or hundreds of thousands of hypotheses simultaneously. And in that setting, uh, he suggested to think about it from a Bayesian perspective. Uh, and uh, and the type 1 error measure is the expected, uh, is the expectation of measures like FDR uh, under a prior. So the prior says that there is some prior probability that each uh, null will be false, that each discover, that, that there's something to discover in each one of our hypotheses. There's some prior small probability. Uh, and therefore, each 
uh, each test we do, the truth for each test we do is actually a sample from a Bernoulli distribution with this small probability. And now we can calculate expectations. So power would be an expectation of how many true discovery we discoveries we make. And type 1 uh, uh, error control would be an expectation of how many false, some measure of how many false discoveries we make, like uh, the false discovery rate. Okay, so I realize it's difficult uh, to explain these things too quickly to if you've never heard of it before. And my point is just uh, in this in this uh, previous paper uh, uh, with Ruth Heller, uh, we show we showed how to think about this as an optimization problem and optimally control the false discovery rate. Uh, before it was only known how to control the marginal false discovery rate, which is some kind of strange hybrid uh, that I won't go into. So I, I realize that, uh, uh, that I can't go into detail, but I want to, to say what the spirit is. The spirit is thinking about these things as optimization problems and, and trying to bravely ask the question, what's the optimal solution? Okay, how can we formulate it as a credible optimization problem and uh, find optimal solutions? This is just to demonstrate that it works and, and helps uh, uh, power. Uh, so I'll just mention in two words that we have a series of other papers around this topic. The first one is sort of a fundamental. To me, it's, it's our most important contribution, but it's sort of more theoretical point of view on this entire uh, uh, problem of how should we think, be thinking about this as an optimization problem and what's solvable and what's not solvable and so on. Uh, the second one, the archive paper is, is interesting probably uh, for this community uh, because it's dealing with what can be computationally uh, uh, feasibly done in problems where the optimal solution is too difficult and there's no chance of finding it. Uh, and then we have other work in progress that I won't get into. Okay, so to summarize, if we think about hypothesis in general, we have one thing we just want to control because we are required to control it. We have another thing which is the power that we want to get as much of as possible. That's, uh, okay, so when we move to multiple testing, uh, uh, everything becomes more confusing, but uh, uh, my point is that we, sti we still should try to stay committed to that optimization view uh, and, and try to, uh, uh, to attack this, uh, and that's about it. It's all about power. Okay.